السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. وعليكم السلام ورحمة الله وبركاته. جزاكم الله خيرا for a very great turnout considering it was very short notice just yesterday evening we alhamdulillah made the announcement and alhamdulillah lots of people came. This is very good. So the thinking is that يوم العرفة يوم الجمعة the time of Hajj the story of Sayyidina Ibrahim is all in the back of our minds. And so to spend the last moments of this blessed day in discussing the life and the story of Sayyidina Ibrahim and to try and take benefits from his story and what made him really the Imam who even the greatest of the Anbiya, our Prophet Muhammad, is being told to follow. What are the qualities in which uh, that our Sayyidina Ibrahim has that made him known, mentioned by Nas in the Quran, that he is the friend and the Khalil of Allah Azza wa Jalla. What is it about Sayyidina Ibrahim that made his station so high in the sight of Allah that when he, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi went to Isra and Mi'raj, the Prophet that he found on the seventh heaven leaning against the Bayt al Ma'mur, with his back against the Bayt al Ma'mur, was none other than Sayyidina Ibrahim Alayhi Salatu Wasalam. What is so special and what benefits can we take from our Prophet Ibrahim that he is the father of all of the Prophets. He has a lineage going back to him of all of the Prophets that have come after him. SubhanAllah. If we look at his family and his lineage, from him were Sayyidina Ismail and Ishaq. And from Sayyidina Ishaq was Sayyidina Ya'qub. And Ya'qub is known as Israel. And Ya'qub had 12 sons. Of them was Sayyidina Yusuf Eventually, after the initial story, you know, initially Sayyidina Yusuf his brothers tried to kill him. And Allah saved him, and he was away from his homeland for a long time. And the story of Yusuf is known. It's a very, very beautiful story, one of the most beautiful stories in history, subhanAllah. And a whole surah is revealed about the qissa of Sayyidina Yusuf. But eventually when they all then tawbah, at the end of it, when eventually Sayyidina Yusuf became the governor of Egypt and they came back to him, to Yusuf, his brothers. And then they said to their father, قَالُوا يَا أَبَانَ اسْتَغْفِرْ لَنَا ذُنُوبَنَا That, oh our father, ask Allah to forgive our mistake. And so Allah forgave them. And so they became the figureheads and the fathers the forefathers all of all of the twelve tribes of Banu Israel. All going back to Sayyidina Ishaq And of course, Ibrahim had another son. In fact, his first son, his first son's name was Ismail. And Ishaq came second, even though Ismail mother came second into the family. And so who is our Sayyidina Ibrahim what are benefits that we can take? I thought maybe if we discuss this in these blessed moments of the day of Arafah, day of Jum'ah, and maybe end the uh, discussion with a dua and etc. I think that was something nice. And so here we are, alhamdulillah, salatu asr, may Allah accept from each and every single one of you for coming. And may Allah accept all these beautiful children, mashallah, that are here also to join us for this story. And he is a family event, so alhamdulillah. He was Sayyidina Ibrahim ibn Aza. But according to historians, they have another name for another name for Ibrahim salam's father. They say his father's name was Tarikh, Tarikh. But Allah says in the Quran that qala Ibrahim li abihi Aza. When when the Prophet Ibrahim addressed his father Aza. But historians and experts of you know, lineage and, 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 and history and Mu'arrikhun, they agree, they have ittifaq, that it can't be the name of Sayyidina Ibrahim Aswasam's father is not Azar, rather it is Tarikh. So what's the solution? The solution is that the Qur'an comes first. The Qur'an comes first unless something as authentic as the Qur'an comes and says otherwise. A way to understand and merge between both the narration of the Qur'an and the opinion of the historians is that 
that perhaps Sayyidina Ibrahim had an uncle by the name of Tariq or Azam. And they have their debates in history and in the tafsir as to who thinks what, but ultimately, he, his lineage goes back from Sayyidina Ibrahim to Azam, to Nahu, to Saru, Ibn Ra'u, Bin Falib, Bin Abid, Bin Shalib, uh, Bin Arfa Shakh, Ibn Sam, Ibn Sam. Sayyidina Nuh alayhi salatu wasalam is the second father of all of humanity. Our first father was who? Sayyidina Adam alayhi salatu wasalam. But after Sayyidina Adam, humanity scattered and, you know, sort of throughout the different parts of the world. And eventually, when the floods came at the time of Sayyidina Nuh, as Maryam was reciting the Qissa of Sayyidina Nuh alayhi salatu wasalam, at the time of the floods, Everybody was destroyed except for the family and the followers of Sayyidina Nuh. And that's why Allah said in the Quran, وَجَعَلْنَا ذُرِّيَّتَهُ هُمُ الْبَاقِينَ That it was the family and the progeny of Sayyidina Nuh that were allowed and were, had, had been blessed to continue living and their lineage to continue in this world. So our first genetic father is Adam. And what the Darwinists and other evolutionists say is but conjecture, is but theories, is but theories, is not fact. It's a theory of evolution, it's not a fact of evolution. And there are other theories out there, and there are Muslim experts who have counted these opinions. But ultimately, the first human being to come to this world was none other than our father Sayyidina Adam who Allah himself fashioned and designed in Jannah. Allahu Akbar. Allah designed and decorated our father Adam in Jannah. And eventually when his body was prepared, he insouled it, gave it a soul. Allah gave it a soul from his command because the ruh is a command of Allah. And so Sayyidina Adam stood 60 feet tall handsome, beautiful, mashaAllah. And Allah, the first thing He done to Adam was the first thing that He done to our Prophet when He became a Prophet. The first thing that Adam was told to do, the first instruction that he received was seek knowledge. I.e. Allah taught him the, no the names of all things. Allah taught Adam, this is the name of this, this is what this is called, and this is what it does. And it is through the knowledge that Allah gave Sayyidina Adam, he became superior to even the angels. And so of course his progeny, they scattered. And then Nuh came and his progeny from his children were Sam and Ham and so on. And the story of Nuh when we discuss it, we talk about this. But eventually, our father in terms of our Sharia that we follow, the deen that we follow, the Hanifiyya. Millata, yes, there's Hanafiyya and there's Hanifiyya. Hanafiyya are those who follow the Hanafi school of law. And Hanifiyya are those who follow the Hanif method and the Sharia of Sayyidina Ibrahim. The word Hanaf originally means something to be crooked, leaned inwards, somewhat bent. So how is it a praise to call ourselves Millata Abikum Ibrahim who was some Makum and Muslim Millata Ibrahim Hanifa? How is that a praise? How is it a praise to be crooked and to be bent and leaned away from something? Well, when there is fasad and when there is corruption, for you to be turned away from it is praiseworthy. When there is fasad and corruption, when there is kufur and shirk, for you to turn away is actually to turn towards the right direction. And so Sayyidina Ibrahim he was born into a family in Sham, in what you call nowadays Syria or Jordan. Sham is a vast area that covers a few countries, Syria, Jordan, Lebanon and so on. Even Bayt al-Maqdis is considered to be a part of Sham and Palestine and so on. He was born there into a family and into a community who were completely indulged in shit. And they used to make idols with their own hands from wood and clay and stone and worship them. And his father, Azar, was actually a maker of these idols. 
And so subhanAllah, one of a very first lesson that's striking to us is that what Allah can bring from where? Allah brought the Imam of all of the Anbiya that came after. And Imam al nas the Imam of all of humanity, his father was not just a mushrik, he was a, a, a leader of the mushrikeen. He used to facilitate shit. He used to make idols. And so the first lesson that you see, subhanAllah, even from his birth is that we get a Nabi, the most noble of the Anbiya, the Khalil of Ar-Rahman, the father of our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu the Jadd. You know, eventually the Jadd, the grand, grand, grandfather, great, great grandfather of our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. His father was who? SubhanAllah. And so never ever can you judge by family who will come from there. You know, sometimes you have very solid and very pious people, but their descendants are evil. Like for example, look at the children of Noah or the child of Noah. The child of Noah, the son of Noah said, I will be safe from Allah's punishment. I'm gonna go and climb the mountain. But Allah said, no, the mountains can't save me. And like so. So lineage and child and son is always a guarantee. That I am the son of Furan and so therefore I will be a jinn. It doesn't work like that in Islam. You are judged based on your actions, based on your, based on what you show, but based on the devotion that you express. And so subhanAllah says that Ibrahim is coming from this family. He is born and as a child, as a child, Allah gave him wisdom. Allah gave him knowledge. Allah gave him the insight to realize that to prostrate to Things which can't even benefit themselves, they can't even benefit, they can't even protect themselves. It doesn't make any sense. Allah says, وَلَقَدْ آتَيْنَا إِبْرَاهِيمَ رُشْدَهُ مِنْ قَبْلِ وَكُنَّا بِهِ عَالِمِينَ That Allah gave Sayyidina Ibrahim his rushd and his, and his ability, his maturity, his intelligence and his wisdom from early on, from before. And so as a young child, he sees his father and his community frustrated to these idols made out of clay and stones and etc. He sees this is not right. This is not, this is not possible. How are these people prostrating to things which can't even make themselves, let alone make other things? And so he decides after discussing with his father, he says to his father that لِمَ تَعْبُدُ مَا لَا يَسْمَعُ وَلَا يُبُسُّهُ وَلَا يُغْنِي عَنْكَ شَيْئًا Oh Father, why do you worship something that does not hear and cannot see and is not able to benefit you in any way? Why do you worship such things? He says, يَا أَبَتِ إِنِّي قَدْ جَاءَنِي مِنَ الْعِلْمِ My Father, knowledge has come to me that you may not have. It's fine I'm younger than you, but I may have a piece of information that you may not. Another striking piece of wisdom and knowledge we like to learn from here is that you don't look at who is saying, you look at what is being said. Because a lot of the times we say, oh, it's just a kid, what's he talking about? We shun it away. But sometimes Allah gives wisdom and knowledge to people even if they're young. Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Abbas used to be allowed while being a teenager to sit in the majalis of the greatest fuqaha and the ulama of the sahaba. The likes of Abu Bakr and Umar, he used to sit among them as a companion, as a colleague, listening, learning, but also benefiting them. So age does not define wisdom, because someone can be old and unwise, whereas someone can be young and be wise, because rushd and guidance is from Allah Jalla Jalla. And so he says, oh my father, I have received knowledge, I have got information that you may not, not, not have. Why are you worshipping this idol? And so his father eventually gets frustrated and says, you know, If you don't stop what you're doing, which is disrespecting our idols, disrespecting our gods, and challenging us and our faith and our, and our creed, because we have found our fathers doing this. This is the way of our forefathers. This statement, this is the way of our forefathers, is repeated throughout history. Mushrikeen, they say, oh, our fathers have been doing this. And the same thing was said by the Meccans and the Quraysh. They said, oh, our fathers have been worshipping these, these idols in Latin, Uzza and Manat, Thalith and Ukhra. This is the way of our forefathers. How dare you insult them? 
But again, just because something has become a part of the culture, it does not necessitate that it is the hal. Vast majority of the ummah and who practice, mashallah, is good. But even sometimes when you go and discuss and debate with some people who are in misguidance, in forms of bid'ah, in, in forms of shirk, minor or major, in forms of kufr even, you tell them, why are you doing this, akhi, you claim to be a Muslim? They say, well, this is the way of our fathers. And this is how our grandfather and our, our maslak or our this and our that is. And it may be incorrect. It may be not even Islamic. But ultimately, we learn from here that just because something has become a part of the tradition, it does not mean that it is Islamic or it is Shari'i. And so he says to him, that if you don't stop, O Ibrahim, then you will be basically cut off from us. You will be stoned. You will be punished. Leave me alone. Leave me alone. Go away from me. So he says, Ibrahim says to his father, Peace be with you. Meaning, meaning you'll be safe. I am not going to do anything to you. I have no evil intention to harm you or to do anything. I am just talking to you, trying to discuss with you, trying to engage with you. سَأَسْتَغْفِرُ لَكَ رَبِّي You have peace and security from me. I will ask Allah to also forgive you. But this particular statement of Sayyidina Ibrahim was something that Allah corrects later on. Allah says that وَمَا كَانَ اسْتِغْفَارُ إِبْرَاهِيمَ لِأَبِيهِ إِلَّا عَمْ مَوْعِدَةٍ وَعَدَهَا إِيَّا فَلَمَّا تَبَيَّنَ لَهُ أَنَّهُ عَلُوهُ لِلَّهِ تَبَرَّأَ مِنْ that initially Sayyidina Ibrahim, because of the love that he has for his father, he said, okay father, that's fine, you're angry with me. It's okay, I'm not going to do anything bad to you. And in fact, I will even ask Allah to forgive you. But when later on he found out that this is not permitted for him to seek forgiveness from Allah for someone who, from someone who is a mushrik. You know, sometimes you think, and this is something that we need to understand. We have mutual love and respect for everybody in our community, in our neighborhood. No Muslims and non-Muslims. However, the decision of the Akhirah is up to Allah. The decision of what happens to people in the Akhirah is, Allah, is up to Allah Jalla Jalla. And so even if you love somebody, but they are not on the faith, you don't have permission to intercede on their behalf. Even the Anbiya do not have the permission to intercede on behalf of someone who has rejected Allah Jalla Jalla himself. We don't have that right, because that person has said, Allah, they have rejected Allah. For you to go to Allah and say, Oh Allah, this person has rejected you, but still forgive them, is rude on your behalf. <coughs> he is Rahman and Rahim. He is more merciful than that person's own mother. And so for you to come and say, Oh Allah, forgive them anyway, that's not your place to talk. You are but a abd. You are but a servant of Allah. And so when Ibrahim was told والسلام, that this is wrong and correct for you to seek forgiveness for your father because he is, he is a mushrik, he basically sought forgiveness from Allah and Allah forgave him. So he said, سَأَسْتَغْفِرُ لَكَ رَبِّي And then eventually he decides that he will not allow for this shit to continue. He will challenge it directly. And so what does he do? He makes a plan to break these idols, but not because to disrespect anybody, but to show them, to show them in reality. Because he, he spoke to them, he debated with them. They are not understanding that this idol, this physical, this thing made out of stone or rock is not going to benefit them. So he wanted to show them an example in, as a practical demonstration. And so he planned that he's going to break some of these idols to show that they can't even help themselves. They can't even benefit themselves. So they had a Eid, a day of celebration, where they would go out of the town and celebrate in their whatever, in their in the in the outer parts, in the outskirts, and so on. They had a place of going to celebrate, celebrate. And so they went. And so when they told Ibrahim, "Come with us," he says, "Qala inni saqeen." He said, "I am unwell." He said, "I am not feeling well." This particular "I am not feeling well" can mean many things. Of them is that I am not feeling well in my emotions. I am not feeling well. In my, in my mind, seeing the kind of kufr and shirk you guys are committing. 
And so, but of course, there are also Prophet Muhammad said that these are things that the Prophet, the Prophet Ibrahim has said. And Sabil Tawriya, you know, even these are you can call it a you can't call it a lie, you can call it a a mentioning of facts, but in a way that benefits the situation. And Allah allows that for certain people at certain places. It happens later on also when Ibrahim Asalam tells the king, the evil king of Egypt, that Sarah is my sister. It's not untrue that it's his sister, because she is his sister in humanity. And so sometimes saying the truth in a way that benefits the situation, but not maybe not what the person is asking directly is permitted for some people to save their lives or to achieve a higher goal. But it's not allowed for normal people or for normal circumstances. You can't twist the truth. You know, we say a white lie. There's no such thing as a white lie. A lie is a lie. The Prophet Muhammad showed us truthfulness in everything. When he was joking, when he was serious, when he was talking, when he was, when he was at war, when he was at peace, he was always truthful. Even when he was joking, you know the story, I've said it before as well to you, that an old woman came to the Prophet Muhammad and said, Oh Prophet Muhammad, you know, ask, me, ask Allah to give me, I want to go to Jannah, ask Allah to take me to Jannah. So he said to her, Oh aunt, you can't go to Jannah. No, he said to her, sorry, Oh aunt, don't you know that old people can't go to Jannah? And you're old, you can't go to Jannah. He said, as a joke. She said, Oh Prophet Muhammad, ask Allah to take me to Jannah. He said, Oh aunt, don't you know that old people can't go to Jannah? She never, he never said, you can't. He said, old people can't go to Jannah. She became all sad and depressed and frustrated. She's about to walk away all sad. She said, Oh aunt, come back. What I meant is that old people will not go to Jannah, you will go to Jannah as a young fair maiden. Allah will make you back to your youth age. And so even though it was a joke, it was still true. So this is not a justification for lying at all. But in this case, he says, I am unwell. And so they leave the city and they leave him behind. And so, وَتَاللَّهِ لَأَكِيدَنَّ أَصْنَامَكُمْ بَعْدَ أَن تُوَلُّوا مُذْبِرِينَ they left the city and he went to the idols. And they left a lot of their food. Imagine, imagine it, doesn't, it wouldn't make all of you guys, mashallah, Muslims. So it doesn't make sense to you. Imagine that you make a lot of like uh, samosa and uh, fita and a lot of uh, halwa and you make your, all of these fancy food that you make. And we make one of our uh, delicacies of silat is khudu with meat and uh, salur burin uh, fita. We have this in our house. Yeah. So imagine you made all this delicious food, or you have your sweets and your ambala and your etc. Right, and your cake. How silly would it be for you to leave some of this food in front of a stone idol and wait for it to get bad and assume that that idol is enjoying or benefiting from this food? That's what they used to do. They used to sacrifice some of their food to their idols and leave it there. So they left all of their all of this food in front of these idols. And then he said, He was basically taking the food, Ibrahim was salam, taking the food to their mouth and saying, You're not going to eat this food. Eat your food, they left it for you. Why are you not eating this food? Again, it was not the initial process. He debated, he discussed, he gave them da'wah. But this was all to show them practically how useless worshipping idols is. And so eventually, he started to break them. Illa kabir lahum, except for the big one. And so the Mufassirun say he broke all of them with an axe and then left the axe hanging on the big one's shoulder. So you can see, imagine a scene, you see a lot of idols broken and you see a big one and the axe is on his shoulder. It looks as though he done it. He went breaking all of them because he said these are competition gods to me. So let me go break them and I will keep the weapon in case someone else comes up. This is the kind of imagery that Sayyidina Ibrahim was drawing up in their mind. They come back and say, Man fa'ala hadha bi aliyatina? Who on earth done this to our gods? Even that sentence doesn't make sense. How can something be done to your gods? God is the one that's omnipotent, omniscient, all powerful, benefits you. You don't have to protect them, the God should protect you. Man fa'ala hadha bi he, who's who done this? He's an oppressor, he's a bad person. They say, oh, okay, now then the investigation mode goes on. 
Who was left behind in the city? Who has a track record of insulting our gods? We heard of a boy. His name is Ibrahim. And what, what we heard, this phrase, we heard that he is like this. We heard him insulting our gods from before. We heard him debating. We heard him that he's got issue with our faith. So it must be him. And so they do their research and oh, it turns out Ibrahim was actually in the city and they were not. قَالُوا فَأْتُوا بِهِ Bring him. على أعين الناس لعلهم يشهدون Let them see how we deal with this great oppressor. This zalim. They're calling him a zalim. And so they bring Sayyidina Ibrahim in their courtyard and in, in, in their, you know, in their, in their jilts and their majlis. They say, they say, Oh Ibrahim, did you really do this to our gods? <coughs> did you, oh Ibrahim, do this, break them up to our gods? Again, the sentence sounds strange to us because mashallah, Allah has guided you to Islam and you realize that Allah is nafi'ah. Allah is the one that gives you benefit. Allah is abdar. From him, from him comes harm. You can't harm Allah or benefit Allah. You can't, Ya ayyuhal nasu antumul fuqara'u ila Allah. You are in need of Allah. Wallahu huwa al-ghaniyu al-hameed. He is the all rich. He is the one that's praised. You cannot benefit Allah. Allah can benefit you. And so they say, Anta fa'alta hadha bi alihatina ya ayyuhal. Did you do this, O Ibrahim, to our books? He's a young boy. So he says, Qala bal fa'ala. Kabiruhu hana. See the big one there? I think it was him. Look, he's got the weapon still in his hand. <laughs> ask them, the one that have been killed, or ask the one that's killed, in if they are able to speak. What's going on? The guy's got a point. But he doesn't make sense. They, you know, when you, when, you, when you do something really, really so silly, so stupid, that you think they are themselves confused. What's he saying to us? What he's saying makes sense, but at the same time, we don't want to accept it because these are our gods. They are confused. They are shocked him with it. What's he saying? What's, he, what's the boy saying? Some are saying, oh, maybe some are agreeing with him. Some are disagreeing. They have their own little, you know, discussion and confusion. Their own beef among themselves now. <laughs> And they say, okay, Ibrahim, we've made our mind up. Ibrahim, you knew, you knew, you know, sir. You know, sir. Sir, you know. You know, Ibrahim, that these guys can't speak. And so this should have been the end of the discussion, right? It's proven. They can't help themselves. They can't help you. They can't protect themselves. They can't protect you. They can't even eat for themselves. They can't feed you. They can't speak for themselves. How are they to speak to you or for you? He's shown all of this in his demonstration that this is weak. Your argument and your faith is weak. Your theology, whatever you may call it, is wrong. So what do they do? They realize, oh my God, oh my goodness, that this guy has really trapped us in our logic. Our brains have come to their limits. Our intellect has come to an end. So what do they do? They do fajr. They become angry. Okay, this guy, he thinks he's clever. He's too clever. There's no solution for him except for, let's destroy him. So these guys, in their ignorance, and in their jahala, and in their stubbornness, and in their arrogance, they were not willing to see logic is in front of them. Ibrahim discussed it with them. He showed it to them in demonstration in clear daylight. The evidence is clear as the sunlight itself. And yet they say, no, we are not going to change our way because this is the way of our forefathers. This is what our teachers have said. And unfortunately, even in this ummah, in this time, we have people like this. You can debate with some of these people how, who are in their jahala. And you will bring them all of the evidences from the Quran and from the Sunnah and from logic and from this and from that. They will say, but my Shaykh said, finish. Doesn't matter even if you bring all of the ayat of the Quran and all of the ahadith of the Sunnah and all of the aqwar of the ulama and all of the aqwar of the sahaba. <coughs> my teacher said, my people have said, my ustad has said. 
This kind of blind following is haram. This kind of blind following which distracts you from the truth is haram. Yes, iqtida and taqlid and following, even without knowing the evidence is jaiz, so long as it is leading you towards huda. It is leading you towards Quran and Sunnah. And so subhanallah, these people of course in a very far distant way of example, and you find they say no, no, no. Instead of accepting your logic, Ya Ibrahim, we are going to punish you. And so what do they do? They say, let's make a massive fire like which no fire has ever been built before. And let's punish him and torture him inside. So would you believe it that they were collecting wood to build this fire for not just days, not just hours, not just months. They were collecting to wood to build this huge, gigantic fire blaze for years. For years. <coughs> and in their shirk and in their polythe polytheism, this collecting fire to burn Ibrahim became an expression of piety for them. Well, I might say that there used to be sometimes, some of them would say, they used to make an oath. That, oh, they used to take an oath by their idol and say, oh idol, if you make this happen for me, then I will become a, a wood collector to burn Ibrahim. So they were building this fire for ages. And that again shows the level of dalal and misguidance they were in, that they were in this engaged for a long time. And the whole community got involved. And so eventually they make, make this, build this massive fire. Then they realize we've got a problem. If we build this fire, we can't get close. We can't throw him, we can't push him inside. How are you going to get the man inside the fire if we can't even get close to the fire? So they said, we'll be, build the catapult. Man Janiq. A man came, gave the idea of building a catapult. You know what a catapult is? It's like a slingshot, but it's a bigger one. So you hold it like that, elastic, you release it, it goes flying. It was one of the tradition, one of the historic sort of, you know, ancient weaponry. And so they said, we'll build a manjaniq, a catapult, and we'll put Ibrahim in it, and we'll throw him inside the fire. A'udhu billah. All of this because they don't want to see the guidance. Was Ibrahim doing this for his own money, for his own benefit, for his own pocket, for himself? No. It was just so that they are saved from adab of nar, and so that they can have achieved, can, can achieve success in this life in the year. But they were persistent in their dhara. And so they build this. And then eventually the day comes when they want to throw Sayyidina Ibrahim into this fire. And this man that built the Manjaniq, the Mufassirun, say that he was so despised in the sight of Allah, Allah eventually caused for the earth to swallow him up. You know, the Adu Allah, the A'da of Allah, the enemies of Allah, they are always brought to justice. They are always brought to justice. Sooner or later. And so even the enemies of Allah today who think that they can do whatever they want and oppress and kill and suppress and so on, it is a matter of time. Allah delays their punishment so that, so that they have an opportunity for guidance or istighfar. But if they, not, if they do not want to, then their crime becomes an evidence against them. Nonetheless, they throw Sayyidina Ibrahim into the... Mufassirun say, while he is flying in there, while he is in the air, in this sort of couple of seconds, Sayyidina Jibreel comes to him and says to Ibrahim, Oh Ibrahim, um, anything I can do? Can I help you in any way? Do you need any help? Sayyidina Ibrahim says to Sayyidina Jibreel, of course you know who Jibreel is, says to Ibrahim, is there anything that I can do for you, oh Ibrahim? So Ibrahim so salam, in that moment he says to him, is it from you? Is the help from you or from Allah? Because if it's from you, then no thanks. And while he has no choice and no help and no one to resort to, he says this dua. Hasbunallahu wa ni'mallahu. This dua was said by Sayyidina Ibrahim when he had no one in this entire existence to help him except Allah Jalla Jalla. And it was also said by our Sayyidina Rasulullah Muhammad when the world turned against him as well. And that's why this dua, Hasbunallah wa ni'mal wakil, memorize it. When you feel like there is no help, there is no option, there is no door, 
You say, Hasbi Allah wa ni'ma al wakil, ni'ma al mawla wa ni'ma al nasiru, Hasbun Allah for all of us. Hasbi Allah is for the singular, for Mufrad. And Hasbun Allah is jam'ah for all of us. Hasbun Allah wa ni'ma al wakil, ni'ma al mawla wa ni'ma al nasiru. When you make this dua to Allah, Allah will find a way out for you. Just like he did for Sayyidina Ibrahim and just like he did for our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said, Hasbunallah, he said, Allah, and what does this dua mean? It means Allah is enough for me. And He is enough for me to rely upon. Ni'mal Mawla, He is what an amazing Lord and Creator and someone to rely upon He is. Wa Ni'mal Nasir, and what an amazing one to help us He is. <coughs> SubhanAllah. Just I've been asked to make an announcement. If you join us and stay with us for, I don't know how long we will be covering, inshaAllah. But if you do carry on up until iftar, then there will be a facility for iftar, inshaAllah. For children, also there will be some food as well, inshallah. So we've got some time, okay? So subhanAllah, Sayyidina Ibrahim is being catapulted into the fire. Allah could have easily asked one of his angels, for example, easy scenario. He tells Mikhail, oh Mikhail, send the wind, let him fly away. Easy, right? Allah could have said to Jibreel, Jibreel, take him and put him to safety. Grab him into safety. Allah could have done that. But Allah decided to express his miracle and his mu'jizah in a different way today. Instead of just diverting Sayyidina Ibrahim from the fire, he wants to change the laws of nature. What does fire do? Children, what does fire do? What does fire do? Burns. But in the case of Sayyidina Ibrahim, what did fire do? Huh? It became a AC. It became an air conditioning for him. Allah says, Kulna ya na kuni Oh, Allah said to the fire, Allah spoke to the fire and realized Allah speaks and can speak to any of his creation. And every single thing in his Allah in Allah's creation speaks to Allah and sings Allah's praise. Allah says in the Quran, Wa min shay'in. That every single thing in existence is praising Allah, is singing Allah's praise, is thanking Allah, glorifying Allah, but you don't understand their praise. And so subhanAllah, Allah speaks to the fire and says, Oh fire, I want you to become cold and comfortable and peaceful and safe for Sayyidina Imam Asha Salaam in this. And so he is in the fire, but he is not being burned. He is in the fire, he is not being touched. He is in the fire, he is comfortable. Later on in his life, he is asked, what were your best days? He says, the most comfortable days of my life was when I was in that fire. Because it was not fire, it was salaman and burden from Allah Azza wa Jal, comfort for him in this dunya, Allah Allah. It goes to show if Allah is on your side, nothing can harm you. Allah alone is nafi'ah. Allah alone can benefit you. And Allah alone can harm you. Even if the entire universe turned against you, if Allah is with you, then it does not matter. Allah will find a way out for you. And that's shown in the situation and in the lesson in the life of Sayyidina Allah. We will say this, that the reason why Sayyidina Ibrahim became so close to Allah is because he was willing to sacrifice everything and anything for the sake of Allah. He was willing to sacrifice anything and everything for the sake of Allah. And that's why he became, he became who he became. In order for you to become a close friend of Allah, to become close to Allah, then you have to leave something behind. You have to play your part. You have to sacrifice. You have to do something. The hadith says, you have to take a step, Allah will take two steps. You come to Allah one hand, span, Allah will come to you even double that. You come to Allah walking, Allah will approach you running. Meaning Allah's rahmah will come to you even faster than you can go and say istighfar. If you just make that effort. But you have to make that effort. And so subhanAllah, Sayyidina Ibrahim, he sacrificed. Throughout his life. Throughout his life. Now let me ask you, there are children here today. For a young boy, for a young boy, to have the intelligence, the courage, 
the wisdom to think for himself while he is just in his junior ages. Does it not require courage? Does it not require a level of sacrifice willing to put themselves at risk? Sayyidina Ibrahim put his own safety, his own life at risk at a young age for what he knew to be the truth. For what he knew to be the truth, he was willing to sacrifice himself. He sacrificed his own health and well-being for the sake of Allah. He then sacrificed the love and respect from his community. You know, is, isn't it nice that when you go home you have a family to respect and to love and to and they welcome you and you have someone to belong? Wouldn't it be sad if you became all lonely and no one in the world liked you became hated? No one wants that. But Sayyidina Ibrahim was willing to give up all of his friends so, his family so, those who love him. He knew that doing this would put him at danger. He would have no friends, he would have no family, they would disown him, he knew this. And yet, he said no. This is the truth, I will stand for it. So he sacrificed his own safety, he sacrificed his own family, he sacrificed his own friends, he sacrificed his own community for the sake of Allah that he knew to be true. And that's just within his junior years, he hasn't even grown up yet probably. And then eventually he's thrown into the fire. He doesn't give up, he's willing to burn for the sake of Allah. And he's in there for many, many days. Eventually, he decides that these people will not take heed to his guidance. So he decides to do hijrah. He decides to do hijrah. Even in this part of the story, hijrah, we take a fa'ida, we take a benefit. You know, we talk about hijrah even nowadays. A lot of people ask me every now and then, oh, Akhi, do you think that we should migrate from this country? Do you think that we should leave this country because it's a country of kufur and it's a country of this and a country of that because of all of the isms that are propagated nowadays? What do you think we should do? We see here that Sayyidina Ibrahim salam was trying and trying and trying until they literally tried to kill him in the Eid al-Hijrah. What we take from here, the guidance is that you are not enforced and it does not become wajib for you to do hijrah until you are fully incapable of practicing a religion. Does that make sense? If someone is physically stopping you from practicing your religion, then you should, and it becomes wajib for you to do hijrah. In the wasi'a. That Allah's land is wasi'a, do hijrah. If you migrate for the sake of Allah, you will see that the, the world is very vast. Most people in this country, and in fact, anyone that lives in one country and one community for a long time, they live in a bubble. They think the whole world behaves in one particular? Yes, sir. Oh, yes, hijrah. What is hijrah? Hijrah means to migrate, to leave your home and to go somewhere else. Do you see? And so the, 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 we learn from here that Sayyidina Ibrahim migrated. I'm going, I'm leaving, I'm doing hijrah. When they did not accept his da'wah, when they tried to kill him, when they tried to burn him, Allah saved him. And so he says, no, I am going to leave now. And so he leaves Sham, and he leaves, and by this time, by the time he is leaving, he is married to his wife, Sarah. The details of the story of his marriage is also there in, in Tariq, but we'll have to speed up a bit because we've got quite a lot to cover still. So he is married eventually to Sarah, salatu we say out of respect and dignity. And Sarah was a noble woman. She was the most beautiful woman of her time. She was the most noble woman of her time. And she was married to the most noble man of the time. Allah allowed for that marriage to continue to take place. And so they left. And in their travels, they went to different lands and different countries. And eventually, they approached the land of Egypt. The land of Misr. That, you know, so many Anbiya have gone to. This is just a side point. You know, sometimes when brothers, they want to go on holiday. And they want to go on a honeymoon, holiday, they want to go with their friends to somewhere. I don't know why do these guys and why do you guys go to these random places which has no you know, historic benefits for you and for your faith, whereas there are much more beautiful places within Muslim lands. People go to like Spain, you can go and visit Alhamdulillah, right, etc. That's fine. But they go to random places, which is, I don't see what benefit there is, except for sunlight. But you go to a place like Subhanallah al-Iskandariya, 
وعين سخنة ومرسى مطروح in Egypt not only will you have the sun not only will you have the, the beach not only will you have white sand you'll also benefit historically subhanallah Sayna, Sinai province and the areas around it subhanallah go and travel go and see see you move it because traveling is so beneficial for you and traveling is encouraged in the Quran and in the Sunnah and also by the ulama Imam Shafi encouraged traveling he said there are benefits of traveling and he listed them and so subhanAllah, he comes eventually to Egypt. Egypt was ruled by... Before that, sorry, before he migrates and he leaves the country, he also was brought to the king Nimrud. He was brought to the king Nimrud. And this Nimrud was again a very vile, evil person. He was so full of himself because of the money that he had and the power that he had, he started to convince himself that he is God. That he was the God himself, just like Fir'aun of Egypt did at, at later on. And so, and so, and so what he does is, uh, they are, he is brought to the king, Nimrud. And Nimrud says to him, and this is in the Quran, أَلَمْ تَرَ إِلَى الَّذِي حَاجَّ إِبْرَاهِيمَ فِي رَبِّهِ أَنْ آتَهُ اللَّهُ إِذْ قَالَ إِبْرَاهِيمُ رَبِّيَ الَّذِي يُحِي وَيُمِيتُ so he is debating and, and, and discussing with this king, evil king, and he's saying, My Lord is the one that gives life, Yuhyi gives life and gives death. So this evil king says, Qala ana uhyi wa umit. I also give life and give death. But this is a lie because no human being can give life or death. <coughs> Giving life is to give it when it's not there. To give someone life is to give them life when it's not there. And to give them death is to give them death through... So let me, let me discuss. Let me explain to you what it means. If a person is alive, okay, and someone murders that person, that person has caused the death by destroying their physical structure. But Allah Azza wa Jal can cause death without damaging the physical structure. Can a human being do that? Can any human being do that? When a person dies, their soul leaves their body. No, someone can be completely healthy. No damage to their physical structure. They're completely healthy and all of a sudden they die. Is that possible? Does it happen? Yes, it happens. And that is the meaning of Allah causes death. Allah causes death to somebody, but if somebody says, oh, I'm just going to murder that person, and that's going to be causing death, this is not the death that we're talking about. Allah causes death, mutlaqan. Even if someone dies from a natural disaster, or from physically being harmed, or from being completely healthy, Allah is the one that causes death. And so this evil king says, I am also causing death and causing life. And so he gets some prisoners and he gets an innocent person and kills him and says, look, I have caused death. This person was supposed to live. And he gets a, an evil person who's supposed to be sentenced, sentenced to death and says, I will free him and I have caused life. It's Barton. This kind of hujjia, this kind of evidence is, is, is a very, very dodgy type of argumentation. This kind of argument and logic is a false logic. It pretends to be, it shows to be logic, but it's not, it's inaccurate, it's false. Because he is also, he knows he is lying. He knows that he can't cause death. He knows that he can't cause life, as in bringing to life someone from death. So Ibrahim Asasam says to him, <coughs> listen to this story, it's very, very beautiful, subhanAllah. Ibrahim والسلام, says to him, Khalas, if you claim to be God, then... فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ يَأْتِي بِالشَّمْسِ مِنَ الْمَشْرِقِ Allah causes for the sun to rise from the east. So you cause it to rise it from the west. And this is when the stupidity of this king is expressed and it becomes, it is shown how. He became, he had no words to say, but how? If he was a clever and a conniving, if he was cleverer than he was, then do you know what he could have said? What is an answer that he could have given right here? Ulama say this. The ulama say that this 
it shows that even though he was a king, he was evil and he was unintelligent, he was unwise, he was not good at debating at all. And so Prophet Ibrahim said that Allah brings the sun from the east, you bring it from the west. There is an answer that he could have given, but he didn't. What's the answer? Does anybody know it? Huh? What does that mean? Okay, possible. Yes. Yes. He could have, because he's arrogant, he's a Catholic. In his kufr and his arrogance, he could have said, actually, I am the one that brings you from the east. So you tell your Allah to bring me from the west. A'udhu Billah. But he never had the intelligence to say this. And he goes to show again that he was not intelligent. Because even his first part of the argument, saying I cause death, I cause life, is, is a false argument. It's not true. But again, he became, you know, uh, he became uh, dumbfounded. He had no words to say. And so Sayyidina Ibrahim won that debate. And eventually he migrated and then he entered into Egypt. And when he entered into Egypt, again, he comes across a very evil king. <laughs> and this evil king is not just evil in his kufr. He's also evil in his, in his desires. And in his passions, he's evil in his desires. He basically has guards and security and his, and his, and his surveillance, surveilling the country, looking for women and to bring their job is to bring him the women that are beautiful and etc and so they see Sayyidina Ibrahim والسلام, and with him is our uh, the, uh, the, the wife of Sayyidina Sara والسلام, and as they are entering into the town the news immediately reaches that there is there is someone within your someone within your country within your land that's the most the most amazing woman that you have ever seen and so he basically says that bring them to my court and so they approach Ibrahim and they say to him who is this woman who is this woman he says she is my sister he doesn't say she is my wife if he said she is my wife they would kill him on the spot because if the king is to take advantage of her they need to get rid of the spouse and so he said right, she is my sister and she is indeed his sister in humanity but nonetheless, they take her to the castle. And in this time, while basically they're preparing to take her, Ibrahim Muhammad says to Sarah that I, they spoke to me and they told me that who am I to you? And I said that you are my sister, so you should also say this. It is true, but it's also to save our life. And so they bring her to the castle. And in this time when Sayyidina Ibrahim Muhammad can do nothing, He's completely helpless once again. Look how many times he's helpless. You know, this is again a, a fa'idah that you can learn as a person, as a Muslim, as a mu'min, that just because you're a believer and a Muslim doesn't mean that you will always have a hunky-dory and luxurious. You will become helpless many, many times in your life. And through ibtila'at and imtihanat, and through tests and tribulations, you will become closer to Allah. The bigger the test, the bigger the reward. The bigger the competition, the bigger the reward. And so look how many times he's helpless. He's helpless as, as a child. He's helpless with Nimrud, he's helpless in the fire, he's helpless in his community, he's helpless from his family, he's helpless once again in front of this evil king in Egypt, in a, in a strange land, in a strange country. So what can he do apart from he stands in Salah? He stands in Salah and they take Sarah to the castle. And so this king, he's so vile and so filthy, he immediately tries to take advantage of her. And her, his hand becomes paralyzed. He can't move it. SubhanAllah. You know, a hadith Qudsi says, Man That whomsoever opposes a friend of mine, Allah proclaims war against that person. And so this Adullah, this kafir, king, evil king, Jibir, by the way, he wants to take advantage of, uh, uh, she is definitely a wali, a friend of Allah. The wife of our Prophet Ibrahim, Allahu Akbar. If Ibrahim is our father, alayhi salatu wasalam, if he, millat abikum Ibrahim, he is our father. <coughs> he is father in the sense, even though, if not maybe biologically, but he is our father in terms of sharia. He is ubu watid deen. They have, we say ubu watid uh, deen, the father of biology, you know, a biological father, and we have ubu watid deen, the fatherhood of religiosity, of piety, of sharia. And so he is our father in that way because we follow his sharia. And so she is our mother, subhanallah. 
He reaches his hand out, his hand becomes paralyzed. And so he realizes straight away that this woman is pious. This woman is close to Allah. This woman is special. So instead of saying to his medics, oh medics, come and save me, come and help me, he realizes where the problem is. He's not completely, completely stupid. He's got a little bit of intellect. He says to Sarah, please make dua for me so that my hand becomes unparalyzed and I will not harm you. He, he basically is asking dua from the very person he tried to attack. But she is subhanAllah kind, she makes dua and his, immediately his hand becomes released. He is, he is he's an evil person, he is, he's disgusting. He tries again, his hand becomes paralyzed again. He's like, oh, please, just one more time. Make dua for me and I will not do anything. She makes dua and it becomes again. So he realized, he says to his God, that you have not, this woman that he have brought me is not an insan. It's basically, it's, 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 it's basically shaitan, he said, it's, it's bad wording. But basically, trying to, he's a devil himself. It's basically, it's not possible. And what kind of person is this? So, now realizing that he's in, his very, in very dangerous waters, that if that person, if that person's dua for him is accepted straight away, imagine that person's dua against him. So now he wants to win the favor and the mercy of this woman. So what does he do? He gives her a gift. He gives her a gift. And the gift is a woman to serve her, a, a permanent servant. And the woman is called Hajar. Alayhi salatu wasalam. Hajar, look, look, at, look how Allah arranges things. Allah <laughs> Man, subhanAllah, the Prophet Ibrahim is coming from Syria and the backstory to why he's in Egypt in the first place. Ibrahim is not even there in this castle. His wife is there. To make her happy, the king gives her a gift to serve her. And this is an Egyptian woman by the name of Hajar. And that's why the Prophet Muhammad, you know, his lineage from his mother's side goes all the way back to Egypt, subhanAllah. Egypt is that connected to our seerah, to our history, to the Anbiya, and to even biologically, subhanAllah. And so he gives Hajar as a gift. Ibrahim as is praying in desperate salah throughout that time. And all of a sudden, a few minutes or a few moments later, he's still in salah. He's desperately calling to Allah. All of a sudden he sees his wife in his salah, Sarah coming into his home wherever he was staying. And with him is another woman. Or with her is another woman. What's going on? She's safe. Nothing's harmed. Forget losing his wife. He has got his wife back plus another woman. What's going on? So he's very concerned in his salah. And so in his salah, he doesn't want to break his salah. Because he would never do that. And at the same time, he doesn't want to carry on praying because he's going to be distracted with the thought. So he indicates with her a hand gesture. A hand gesture is jayis, even in our sharia to indicate something in salah because of a benefit, because of a harm, to, to give some guidance is jayis. Okay, it's allowed. And so he says to his wife in an indication, what happened? What's going on? So you can imagine, like, sort of, what's going on? She says that Allah Azza wa Jal has saved me and Allah has given me this woman as a gift also, subhanAllah. Ibrahim Salam by this age is very old. So is Sarah, is very old, they have no children. And so eventually, Sarah gives permission to Sayyidina Ibrahim to get married to Hajar. He encourages, he says, get married. She encourages her, he says, get married to her. But then, subhanAllah, soon Allah favors Hajar in a way that he has not favored Sarah. And so, soon enough, Hajar is with child and she's expecting and she's pregnant and she has a child and the child that's born is none other than who? Ismail 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 is born healthy, strong MashaAllah beautiful, handsome all of the qualities that you could want in a child is in Ismail and so the love and, and the fondness of Sayyidina Ibrahim is inclined towards Hajar and thereby of course the child do you see? And so, Ulama says, well, it's, it's narrated numerously, and there's nothing strange about it, that Sarah, salam, she basically had some emotional, you know, she was emotionally a bit upset about this. 
And so he kind of encouraged her, but that wasn't the reason why. Allah told the Prophet Ibrahim that you have a new sacrifice to make. Can you see how many sacrifices already made so far? Allah is basically put him into a test and a tribulation whereby his family, his wife, and for those of you who love your wives, you know what that means, right? You have this protective feeling of your family, your wife. You know, imagine you would get angry even if someone is looking at your wife in a strange way. And you should have, this is normal, this is fine. You know, nowadays, the tradition and the culture that we live in, they portray this as a negative thing. Oh, he's so jealous. Yes, he is jealous. But this is a protective jealousy, which is jealous. This is a ghira, that which a Muslim should have. The opposite of this is forbidden. Men who display their women and take pride in it are strange people. They are known as the day youth. The one that shows his wife to the world and he thinks that's, that's some sort of a good thing. No, this is not. It shows that you don't have this level of dignity and respect to protect. And I, subhanAllah, I don't want to... I was in a country, I'm not going to say which country. Okay? I was in a country recently. I was in an Arab country recently. And I saw the strangest thing that I have ever seen. I was, I was shocked. I was shocked. I was, how can I see this? I see a man... I see a man covered from head to toe. He's wearing the scarf. He's got something on top of the scarf to hold the scarf. He's got a burqa on, or the thaw, sorry, on. <laughs> He's got a foul on from top to bottom. Everything. He is so covered. I think he even had a niqab, a mask on, sorry. And he's walking with a woman. She has no head cover. She has no body cover. She has no leg cover. And I straight away thought that these people have made it exactly opposite. The man's aura is up to the knees. And the woman's aura is how the man is wearing it. And this man is walking very proudly in a very big shopping center. And he's like, I can see the pride in his, you know, in his walk and his, you know, and oh, look at me. I've got, a, I've got a woman that everyone's looking at. This is very strange. This is not fitrah. This is not from the natural protectiveness that a man, a, hu a human being feel towards their spouse. Women feel it too. Sisters don't like it when the man is dressing too nicely to go out. They're like, what's going on? Where are you going, man? Where are you going, boss? They don't like this as well. But it's fine, it's like obviously making yourself presentable. So naturally, you know, the Ummahat al Mumineen, Aisha, the Allah, and the Arda, she also says, and others, you know, this is a natural feeling. And so Allah says to Sayyidina Ibrahim والسلام, that you have a new sacrifice to make, and that is to start. But the most difficult of the journeys now. Because so far, every journey that he has made, he had a starting point where there were people, where there is civilization. And an end point where there are people, where there is civilization. Now Allah tells him, after having been gifted with a child after years and years of sabr, the perfect child Allah gives him as a gift. Allah says, now take this wife of yours, your beloved wife, and your child and take them to a land where there are no forget human beings there is no life there is no water if there's no water there is no life it's just desert clear plain desert and so do you think Sayyidina Ibrahim is going to say Allah but come on I just had a child he's a newborn you know wait for a few years uh, let's see what happens straight away responds immediately Immediately he gets up and he leaves with Sayyidina Ismail والسلام, and Hajar and he begins his journey. Travelling towards Makkah al Mukarramah. At that time. It was inside here. <coughs> Get out. Come on inside, come on inside. I'm scared. <laughs> uh, do we listen to the story? Yeah? This is where it gets really interesting. So they travel, subhanAllah, towards Makkah al Mukarram. And Sarah is left behind. And they go to Makkah al Mukarram and they're traveling for, for days, for months, in the desert. Eventually they arrive at the destination. And ulama say that this was at the time of Guruba Shams, towards the end of the day. It's getting dark. Can you imagine? Middle of a desert, just a little bit of water left. 
is about to become dark. And at this time, as soon as Ibrahim takes them to the destination of Mecca, he straight away begins to turn back and go back. And so Hajar is following behind and saying, where are you going? Talk to me, explain to me what's going on. He carries on walking, he has nothing to say. What's he going to say? Eventually she says to him, Allah amaraka bihada. Did Allah command you to do this? Of course, in the written Arabic. She said in her language, she said, what did Allah tell you, tell you to do this? To leave me behind like this. <coughs> he said, yes. She said, in that case, Allah will not, Allah will not cause us to be, Allah will not destroy us. Allah will take care of us. But this is why she deserved to be the great, great, great grandmother grandmother and the mother of the greatest of Ambiya. Ismail and Sayyidina Muhammad you know, she had that level of tawakkul and that level of iman and faith that in the middle of a desert with just a, a bit of water which is going to finish in a, in a few moments she is saying if Allah told you khalas don't worry I will be fine Sayyidina Ibrahim is but a human do you think it wasn't hurting him to leave his family behind like this? Do you think it wasn't emotionally difficult for him? Do you think he wasn't upset? Do you think he wasn't burning and, and hurting inside? Of course he was. This is his child. But he is an obedient servant of Allah. He is Khalil rahman He is Khalil Allah. He, he is, even though he loves his child, he loves Allah. And so after he leaves the city and behind, when he basically, they can't see him anymore. And that's when he makes the dua that's quoted in the Quran. That, رَبَّنَا إِنِّي أَسْكَنْتُ مِنْ ذُرِّيَّتِي بِوَادٍ غَيْرِ ذِي زَرْعٍ عِنْدَ بَيْتِكَ الْمُحَرَّةِ Oh Allah, I have placed from my children, from my family, I have placed my family in a valley where there is no plantation next to your sanctified and dignified house. فَجْعَلْ أَفْئِدَةً مِّنَ النَّاسِ تَهْوِي إِلَيْهِ So, O oh Allah, they are alone. Give them companionship. Make people come and reside with them. وَرْزُقْهُمْ مِّنَ الثَّمَرَاتِ And provide for them not just water, provide for them fruits. Fruits. لَعَلَّهُمْ يَشْكُرُونَ So that they, are, they may be thankful. رَبَّنَا إِنَّكَ تَعْنِ كَرِزُمُ الدُّعَانِ بِيْكَ سَنْدُعَانِ Hajar alayhi salatu wassalam That's Ibrahim alayhi salatu wassalam He has fulfilled his command of Allah He has lived up to the command of his creator He has lived up to his, to his reputation of امتثال لأمر الله Immediately And so he's departing now But what do you think happened to Hajar? Do you think she's no human being? She is a human being She is stressed out She is she is hot, she is upset, she is sad, she is scared, she is thirsty. All of the emotions, all of the negative emotions you can imagine. She is experiencing all of them at the same time. She is with her child, the child is crying, the child is upset, the child is hungry. But she can't provide. <coughs> and so in her desperation, one to find resource for her child, but also to just have a moment of having a break to see, I don't want to see my child's face in this situation, crying desperate like this. I can't tolerate seeing my child gasping for water and I can't provide. She runs. She runs to suffer. And she climbs suffer. And she looks around. She sees nobody, nothing. She sees another mountain to the other side. She sees Marwa. She runs to Marwa and she stands on top of it and she makes dua to Allah and she's looking around. She sees nobody and nothing. She comes back to Safa and back to Marwa and Safa and Marwa and Safa. Seven times she's, done, she's doing her laps of search. Eventually, she hears a sound. She hears a sound and she rushes back to her child. She rushes back, she rushes back to her child and She's scared for herself. And she can't believe the sound herself. She's shocked at the sound itself. SubhanAllah, just notice what's happening here. This woman, Hajar, 
she was a servant. From being a servant, she is the wife of Khalil al-Rahman. Then from being that, she is to become, she is now the mother of Ismail alayhi salatu salam. She is now the woman in whose footsteps Hujjaj li baytillah will forever for eternity be running just like she ran in desperation. We too are running and will be running and do run whenever we go for our Umrah and our Hajj. She ran for desperation of water and provision. We run for desperation for Allah's forgiveness. May Allah rahmah subhanahu And so she hears this sound and she comes back to Sayyidina Ibrahim alayhi salam and she sees a man there. And the man says, I am a messenger from your crew, from your Lord. And so Sayyidina Ibrahim thumps, sorry, Sayyidina Jibreel thumps the floor with his foot or with his wing and out sprouts lots of water. Out sprouts lots of fresh drinking water from the middle of a desert. Can you imagine? From the middle of a desert, water, fresh spring, zamzam water begins to flow. And so, Hadar starts to gather this water to try and protect it, to, to make sure it's not drying away. The Prophet said that, you know, may Allah have mercy upon Hajar. Had she not stopped the water from flowing, this would have become a stream, one of the greatest, one of the most beautiful, one of the greatest streams and lakes of fresh drinking water, subhanAllah. And until today, even though it's not a lake, it is still the most miraculous well in the whole of the earth, the whole of the world. The amount of water that's pulled out of Zamzam every single day is mind-boggling. It doesn't make any logical sense. It doesn't make any scientific sense. The lead is going to the millions and it keeps on providing, subhanAllah. And so she drinks from the child. And, sorry, she drinks for, she provides drinking water for the child, sorry. And the child drinks from, from, from her. And the Zamzam water, subhanAllah, one of the, one of the miraculous things about Zamzam is that it quenches your thirst and your hunger. One of the miraculous things about Zamzam is it quenches your thirst and your hunger. Try it one time. I haven't tried it yet. But we should try it. This is one of the amazing things about the Zamzam itself. Because they were living on just Zamzam for many days. It's that same Zamzam. Zamzam. And the Prophet saw some said the hadith also that you know the, the Zamzam it's it's is ta it is ta'am as well as sharab. It is a provision, food as well as drink. And so Soon enough, there was a tribe traveling nearby, you probably heard this story, from Yemen, the Jurhum, the Jurhumites, um, were from a, a Yemeni tribe, and they're traveling, and they were from the Arab who remained, you know, as you know, historically, where do all Arabs come from? Daesh. Daesh. Huh? Yemen. Daesh. Yemen. Yemen. Yemen, Yemen is the source of Arabs. Yemen. They come, the, 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 even the Arabs, there are, so Arabs are divided into different categories. The Arab that became extinct, like Al and Thamud that were destroyed because of punishment from Allah. And then there's Arab al baqiyah the ones that remained. And from them are some, were some in Yemen. Or, or they were in Yemen. And from them, they, they would travel from along the sea route. Along Jidda, or called Jidda now, along the Red Sea, they would travel for their trade routes and etc. They would travel. And so they had, of course, their way of navigation. They would take guidance. They also had their ways of spotting different types of birds. And they knew what, type, what types of birds do what. And so, unusual to their norm, they see a group of birds flying in and around Mecca, where there is no water, but they see that they are flying and behaving in a way as though there is water there. And so the Jurhumites come and they come and seek permission from Hajar alayhi salatu wasalam and say, can we stay with you? The Prophet, the Prophet Ibrahim made what dua? That I have made some of my family stay in this biwadin ghayri li zara. So allow for some people to come to them. That dua was almost immediately answered. And so Banu Jurhum, they, the Jurhumites, they come and they say, can we stay with you? And Hajar says, you can, but the water is mine. Yes. She wants companionship, 
but she also wants to control the water because Allah gave it to her as a gift. And so through this way, they become noble and respected and secure and safe and important in that initial community that was being built in Mecca to Muharram. And so soon, subhanAllah, Ismail, baby Ismail, is being brought up in the Arab, and from there he learns his Arabic language. Can you put your place on the floor, please? Jibir, excuse me, Jibir, sit down on the floor, and don't do anything, sit down. Everyone else is sitting comfortably. Sit down. Sit, turn this way. Sit down. Turn this way completely. Thank you. And Ismail grows up in this way. But Ibrahim would come back and forth regularly. He would come back and forth regularly to visit. On one of his visits, when he comes to visit Sayyidina Ismail in Hajar, he now Ismail is of an age that he can basically say maybe the age of ten. For them, he is able to basically run around, and also if his father says do this, do that, he's able to basically fulfill those commands and fulfill the needs and so on. At that age, especially if the child is an obedient child and listens to you, yeah, then this is one of the best ages because the child is, mashallah, you love your child. He is handsome and beautiful and cute to you and you play and you talk and you learn together and he learns from you and he listens to you. This is one of the nicest ages. And this is when the love for the child grows to a very, very high degree, you know, highest, you know, one of the highest perhaps. Because after that, when they're in their teenagers, you can go this way or that way, subhanAllah. And then they become adults and they do, they, they do their own things. But that at that age, at that age of, of maximum love, and, and maximum emotion. Allah Azza wa Jal is now to test Sayyidina Ibrahim once again in the most difficult perhaps way. Out of all of the tests so far that he had completed and mastered and got hundred out of hundred in all the examinations that Ibrahim Azza was tested in, now is perhaps the most difficult test. Allah says, Allah doesn't say actually, Allah shows a dream to Sayyidina Ibrahim. And in this dream, Ibrahim sees that he is, he is slaughtering his own son. And Ru'yatul Anbiya, the dreams of the Anbiya is true. But and yet, and yet, this is how Ibrahim was. He would take Allah's command at the earliest sight of it. And he would fulfill it to its maximum possibility of being fulfilled, to its complete fulfillment. How so? This command, even though it's in the ru'ya, however, it is not a direct command from a malak. Do you see? It is a very difficult command. But even though he came to him in the dream, he immediately responded. And instead of just dragging his child, he also used his wisdom. He basically said to his son, قَالَ يَا بُنَيْ O oh my son, إِنِّي أَرَى فِي الْمَنَامِ I have seen in my dream. The son is a young boy, Ismail <coughs> The father is saying, I have seen in a dream. The son could have said, okay, that's just a dream, dad. It's just a dream, wake up. But no, just like father, like son, he made dua for his children, and his children, subhanAllah, Ismail was obedient. And he was wise, and he was clever, and he was intelligent, and he was strong, and he was all of the qualities of positivity were in Ismail And so, subhanAllah, instead of saying all of this, Sayyidina Ismail says, قَالَ يَا أَبَتْ O oh my beloved father, if مَا تُؤْمَرْ Do what you have been commanded. And then he says, سَتَجِدُنِي You do what you need to, O dad. You will find me, inshaAllah, by the permission of Allah, min as sabirin I will be patient. He didn't say, oh, I'm a strong lad, don't worry, it's fine, I'm strong, I'm brave. He said, inshallah, if Allah allows, then I will be patient. He's maintaining his humility, but also obedient at the same time. <coughs> Subhanallah. They both submitted, the son and the child. فَلَمَّا أَسْلَمَا They both submitted to the command of Allah. Then Ibrahim والسلام, takes his son Ismail and is traveling with him to the place of the designated slaughter. 
As he is traveling with him, holding him by his hand, even without telling his mother, because he knows, subhanAllah, she would become emotional. He is traveling with his child, and all of a sudden, he sees Iblis coming to him, trying to convince him, trying to give him muswas and saying, don't do this, it's not a good idea. So he grabs a stone and throws at him. And what do you do now when you go to the Jamrah? This is the first Jamrah. Because Ibrahim is stoning the Shaytan. The Shaytan is not there anymore. Or maybe he is. Some people take it way too personally. They go to the, <laughs> they go to the stones, they take the stones, and they go and hit the brick. It's a massive wall. Do you think that wall was there from the time of Ibrahim No, 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 no. Shaitan is not probably even there, but it's because we are fulfilling the sunnah and the millah and the way of Ibrahim And so some people say, take this one, Shaitan. Oh Lord, like you know, some people say in Bangla, and I saw it. I was once in Hajj a long time ago, and I was with the man. So he must, you know, from Muzdalifa, you collect all the stones. And you put them in a bottle, because it's a small size of bottle, because they go inside the neck, that means they're small enough. So Azuda, one brother, he's stoning on the third day, he had some stones left. And so he was very angry and passionate. He got the whole bottle, he said, in Bangladesh, like, oh Lord, it's like, <laughs> he was like, very angry, like, take this one, Shaitan, you know, this is me. And I'm sure you saw that video of the elderly uncle. He's like, he's throwing it like it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a cricket ball or something. But people get away, people start throwing their umbrellas, their shoes. <laughs> And then in the evening time, the cleaners probably benefit from all of that. <laughs> Subhanallah. But it's because Iblis tried to distract him. He threw a stone. And then a bit later, he tried to distract him again. So he threw a stone at him again. And so that's the second Jamrah. And the third time, and eventually he arrived at the destination of the place that Allah commanded him that this is the place that you shall, you shall carry out what Allah Azza wa Jalla has commanded you. So then Ibrahim said to his son, or his son said to him, that, oh father, since you need to slaughter, and it's a very, subhanAllah, look, look how much of a difficult test it is. Did he just say, okay, take your son and chuck him away somewhere? Many dads would perhaps like to do that. Or find it easier to do that, sorry, that's what I meant. That was supposed to be in direct to you, but he's never listening, subhanAllah. You know, if he just said, take your son and give him away, that's easy, right? If he said, get someone else to do this, come on, on your behalf. That's also easier than saying, take your own son and do it yourself. And he didn't just say, like, leave him somewhere far away. He basically said, slaughter, I just like you do to a, a sacrificial animal, a sheep or a goat or a cow. So, وَتَلَّهُ لِلْجَبِينَ Ismail says to him, Father, face me downwards. Because if you see my face, you will feel emotional. If you feel sad, you will stop. Look how it is. He, he, he takes the command on from the earlier side of commandment and he fulfills it to the best of his ability. To, to, to the best way that it can be fulfilled. And so he turns him down and he closes his eyes and he starts to apply the knife. And he's thinking that I am doing what Allah told me to do. He opens his eyes and he sees that he slaughtered a sheep and his son is next to him watching. وَفَدَيْنَاهُ بِذِبْحٍ عَظِيمٍ Allah sent him a goat or a sheep of that type, you know, from Jannah to slaughter instead of Sayyidina Ismail alayhi salatu wasalam. What do I say here? That if had he slaughtered Ismail really, then it would be a very difficult task for us to go to Hajj. You'd have to take all your children every year, come back with an extra passport. <laughs> One way tickets for something, but I will do that. No, no, it's, we're making a mistake. We're trying to keep it uh, light as well because, subhanAllah, this is not how our sharia works. Allah's sharia is wise. Allah's sharia is full of rahmah. But this was a test to see how far he would go, only to be given the certification later on that he is imam of the whole of humanity. So that happens. And then so he goes back and forth again. And then one, on one occasion he comes back and he finds that his Ismail has now Married. And then he comes another time, he finds that he married a different woman. And there was a, a small detail to that as well. He said, you know, he, he left a message, a coded message to say, you know what, and etc. 
But then eventually the command comes that you are now to build the house of Allah the Kaaba. Allah told him, this is the designated area. Designated area. Build a house. Build a allocated area, build some bricks. Build some stones. The task is done with just a few stones, isn't it? Because Allah didn't say build it up to this high, this width. No, he just said make a house. Make a house. But Sayyidina Ibrahim, what does he do? He takes the command at the earliest sight and he sees it through until the best completion. So he says to his son, will you help me with this? He says, yes. And so Ismail was getting the bricks and getting the stones and Sayyidina Ibrahim was putting them into place. He's building it high and high and high. He didn't have to. Eventually, he got a larger stone to stand upon it to place the higher stone. And that is called the Maqam of Ibrahim. That's where he stood to place the higher stones, the final stones of the Kaaba. And that's where the Maqam of Ibrahim is there. And whoever does Tawaf, whoever does Umrah, you have to pray at Maqam Ibrahim as a part of your Umrah and as a part of your Tawaf. SubhanAllah. The family of Sayyidina Ibrahim was so blessed, so fortunate, so beloved to Allah. And eventually Sayyidina Ibrahim wasalam, in his traveling back and forth, he eventually dies with back in his in his homeland. And he is and he is he's buried there until today. And Sayyidina Ismail continued to live in, in, in Mecca. And from his progeny was our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But look, Allah says in the Quran, Wa tala Ibrahim Rabbuhu bi kalimatin. But when Allah tested Sayyidina Ibrahim with many, many different commandments, and Ibrahim fulfilled them, fulfilled them. And then at that time, That's when Allah said, I will now make you an Imam for the whole of, whole of mankind. Brothers, the lesson from this is that Allah will test you in different ways in your life. If you are able to pass this test, Allah will raise your ranks. Does that make sense? If you are able to pass these tests, Allah will raise your ranks. Allah will forgive your sins, yes. Allah will also raise your ranks through these tests. We also learn that if you want to become a close servant of Allah, beloved to Allah, then you have to be willing to sacrifice that which is beloved to you for the sake of Allah. Allah will never ask you to sacrifice and to do something that's beyond your capability. But what's within your capability, you have to be willing to sacrifice. May Allah give us tawfiq and understanding. We have about five minutes left until Salat al Maghrib. Use this time for dua. And if thought, inshallah, we'll be having to be in the last May Allah forgive all of our sins and accept from all of us. Amen. And accept our ibadah of, of Yawm al Arafah. And give us the ability to take istifada and to take fawa'id and to take benefits from the story of Sayyidina Abuna Ibrahim. Alayhi salatu wa salam. Wa sallallahu wa sallam. Ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sallam. Wa ashabihi wa sallam. والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته